All right, let's do a demo of where I think you're going to end up. Let's slay Goliath by saying, this is Goliath, this is what it's about. And we're going to start out at the end of, you already know how this works, and that's where you're going to be about midterm. But let's go through and walk through it. There are a bunch of things going on in this piece of code. And this website that I've built, it uses some code that I didn't build, but I have modified it for this class. The link is in the syllabus for you to be able to get to it, and you can cut and paste a piece of code in here and do exactly what I'm doing. Now, sorting is one of the more common things that computers do. In fact, some years back, I read that 60% of all time that CPUs spend in computers is spent sorting. So this is a particular sort called quick sort. Ironically enough, quick sort is not the fastest approach to sorting. There are faster ones. But it's good for what we're trying to do, illustrate some Python. Now, we start out with this thing, which is an array, which is a set of values. And computers store values. This is one way to store values in an array. And then it's going to print it out. We're actually going to be able to see it print that. What does it mean to print out something in your code? We're going to take a look at that. Then we're going to do something down here called quick sort on that array, which means ARR down here is going to become array up here in this function. When we do that, then it's going to come up here and run this piece of code up here. And then when we get done, we have the sorted array, and we're going to print out the sorted array. So that's kind of the high level overview. Now quick sort takes this and rearranges the values so that they're in order, as in smallest to largest. Now some things you have to know to make this make sense. First of all, if I have just one value, is it sorted in a list of values? Well, kind of by definition. Yeah, so all lists of one value are sorted. We're going to take advantage of that. So if the length is less than two, that means it has one thing in it, then guess what? That's a sorted list. Now, if we can break a problem down into these are sorted lists and these are unsorted lists and we're trying to sort, then all we have to do is take the unsorted lists and work on them. So the only way it can be unsorted is if it's bigger than two. So that's what we do down here. And we say arbitrarily pick out a value out of this array. Now, this arbitrary pick, since we know it's at least too long, we'll just pick the first value for no particular reason other than it's easy to pick. And then we're going to go out and we're going to say, give me back a list of all the things that are less than that value. And then give me back a list of all the things that are larger than that value. And we have some function that does that. And put those lists in order while you're doing it. And then when I get done, what I really want is I want to take these lists and I want the ones that are less than our arbitrarily picked value, our arbitrarily picked value, and our larger than our arbitrarily picked value. So we're going to combine those together into one single list. Now, interestingly enough, our tool that will go out and give us a sorted list of values, okay, is this quick sort routine that will say, oh, if I have a list of values sorted, so this is a particular thing called recursion, where when we want to get that list of things that are less than this, we do two things. First of all, we have this little piece in here that says, pick out of our list all those values that are less than our arbitrary value. And up here, right down here, we have the opposite, which is pick out of our list all those things that are larger than our arbitrary value. So we can split our list into pieces. Then we use this routine quick sort that we know that works on lists to sort lists to go out and sort those pieces that are less and pieces that are larger. All right. Now, programming is the process of having a concept in your head, an idea. Either you did a design, you were given a design, but you've got some idea. And breaking it into pieces where you can implement that idea and then make a computer do that idea. So let's have it actually run this. And I clicked on the visualize. And this is what's going on in the computer. And this is also kind of what I think about in my head when I go to build a piece of code. So hopefully this will give you an intuitive understanding of the code. Now, when I click Next in here, 
it's going to, first thing it's going to do is it's going to digest whatever this definition is. And Python is going to say that quicksort is pointing to a function named quicksort of an array. So it digests that. And the next thing it does is this array. Now, when it creates this variable ARR, it points at this list of values. And over here is the list of values. So it stores those values in memory where it can work on them. And it, when we print it out, we see that we have this list of 1, 4, 2, 3, 5. This is our little area up here where it prints it. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we want to sort it. So it's going to call the quick sort. Remember, it digested it before up here. Now it's actually going to call it, and it's going to say that its variable array points at this chunk of data. Now notice the name has changed from ARR to array, and that happens all the time when you call functions. And then it's going to walk through one step at a time in the code. So it's going to say, is the length less than 2? Well, the length here is 5, because there are 5 elements. Notice that the subscripts for the elements are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So they start out at 0, but there's 5 elements. That's really common in programming languages. And it says, is the length less than 2? Well, the length is 5, so it comes down here to the second section. So it's dividing and conquering the work and saying, by golly, that case didn't apply. And now we're going to say, OK, I want this point to be a variable in my code that has the sub-zero element. There is the sub-zero. There is the one. And it says point is now 1. Now, we have this thing called a list comprehension. That list comprehension is the piece that I highlighted before. That's that guy right in there. So that's the piece that we're looking at as a list comprehension. And it's going to say, give me all of those things that are less than 1 in this list. Now, what are all the values that are less than 1 in the list? Well, there aren't going to be any. And next thing it's going to do is it's going to say, call quicksort with this new thing that is this list comprehension. So it does some stuff to build the list comprehension. And it goes through some steps. And I'm clicking through the steps as it does it. And guess what? It had an empty list. Now, a list with one value in it is sorted. How about a list with no values in it? So it returns. And that's a sorted list, but that list is empty. It's an empty list. So what's going to happen? We came up here. Is the length less than for an empty list less than 2? Yeah, it's empty. And it's just going to return the list, because by definition, empty lists are sorted too. So it returns an empty list. And guess what? Less points now at an empty list. So the list with no values in it is also sorted. That's kind of a convenient thing. The next thing is we do the same sort of a process where we go through a list comprehension. We build up all the values in that list. OK, now what are the values that are greater than 1? Uh, well, 4 is greater than 1, 2 is greater than 1, 3 is greater than 1, 5 is greater than 1. So all of these values are greater than 1, and that's the list we're passing to our sorting function that will return a sorted list. So we call quicksort now with another set of values. This time, array points at this list of values that we're using. And it's big enough that, yes, it's going to have to sort this list. Now, in this process, point, now notice that this point is different than this point up here. Point is now 4. It's the first thing in that list as we pick it out. Okay. And guess what we want to do with 4? We want to find all those values that are less than 4 in our list comprehension. So it's going to do some work to build that list comprehension. As it builds that list comprehension, it finds that 2 and 3 are less than 4. So it's going to build the list of 2 and 3. And if we have a list of two values, what do we do to sort it? Well, we've got a function that we can call. And we can pass it that list of 2 and 3. And we can get back a sorted list. So it's got more than one or zero values in it, so it's going to have to sort it. So it picks out the point of 2, 
And at two, it says, okay, let's find all the values that are less than two. Oh, it's an empty list. We know what happens with empty lists. We return them and we just are gonna keep that empty list. And two and three, it's gonna find that three is, yes, a list and pick out the values using its list comprehension for those values that are greater than two. And by golly, we have, yes, a list with one value in it. What happens with lists with one value? Well, by definition, one value is sorted, so it has a list of three. Now it's going to take that empty list, two and three, and concatenate it. So it's in the process of returning that. So now we're on the other side of this, and look, the return value is a list of two and three. Is a list of two and three sorted? Well, yeah. Isn't that kind of cool? It's sorted. All right, now, we have this list of two and three that's sorted, and they were less than four. Remember our point from before that was four? Oh, but we also need to find out the list of values that's bigger than four. So we're going to do a list comprehension. We're going to go out and pick out the values that are bigger than four, and that's a list of five. And when we have a list with one value, what's going to happen? Well, a list of one value is sorted. So now we've got a combination of things. We've got a return value of a list the greater than, which is five, less, which is two and three, and a point that's four. So if we put those in order, the less, the point, and the greater, and we concatenate them all together, stick them all together, we'll have a list that's sorted. Oh, look at that, a list to return of two, three, four, five, in order. And now we can go back to where we got called for this and return that list. Now remember, in our original call, we had a point of one. And we had an empty list, because it was sorted, that we were going to concatenate onto the one, and then we needed a list of these other values. And when we concatenate all those together, we get a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's sorted. So now we're going to return that list to whoever called us, and we're going to print it out. And there is our final result, printed out the list. So by breaking the problem down into pieces of saying, yeah, little lists with nothing in them, lists with one are sorted, and being able to say, I know that if I take a sorted list of less than values, an arbitrary value, and a sorted list of greater than values, and I concatenate them together, that if I do those things and I start out with sorted lists, I can have a result of something that ends up sorted. And I've broken the problem down into pieces, and I've used some functions that I've already built, like quicksort, for being able to take the values, concatenate them, and turn them into a single value, set of values that's sorted. Now there are a whole bunch of things going on in this code. My goodness. Let, let's, um, before we get there, do realize that there is a previous button in this, and you can walk backwards through the code too, so you can see what happened in the past. But let's go, you know, to the last and go back to where we entered the code and let's look at it. I had said, here's a list comprehension, here's function calls, here's assignment of variables, okay, here's concatenation of lists, here's lists and prints. Okay, so there's lots of things going on and we're going to start breaking down these pieces and going through them with, yeah, the least interesting, which is what's a variable? What is a list? How does the computer store information? It turns out that computers don't store information quite the same way as us humans generally work with information. But there's a way to translate what we're used to, base 10 numbers, into what it works on. And translate strings into what it works on. So there's an encoding, a method for getting from our world to the computer world. Now, when I go through and I do this visualization and I run through a bunch of steps, this is the kind of thing that I'm thinking about in my head as I'm building a piece of code. I'm mentally illustrating this visualization with these steps, with these arrangements of memory, and how I go about efficiently manipulating the insides of the computer to get the results that I want. That concept of this is what the computer is doing and how I efficiently manipulate it is what you do as a programmer. 
That is data structures and algorithms. We have classes just specifically on algorithms and how to efficiently do it. There are inefficient ways to sort. Quick sort is not the most efficient, but it is a reasonably efficient way to sort. But it illustrates what we want to do in this class. So in your future in the computer science, you've got other things that focus on this. But this concept of here's what's going on. Here's what the values are in my variables. Here is how they fit together and how they're going to interact. Okay, that is what you're trying to build. Now, the reality is that lots and lots of times you build the wrong thing. And computers have no common sense. They will implement the wrong thing. So most of your time, the problems that you face in developing software are you created the software and you told the computer to do A, but it really needs to do B. And your concept in your head is B. And what is the difference between the concept you have and what the computer is doing? And that process of getting from A to B is how you fix your code. And we're going to spend a lot of time on how you fix your code and how you make certain your code stays fixed. Most of the time in programs, you build some, you test, you fix, you get something to work, and then you go around and you add some new stuff to it. And you want the stuff you already built to still work. You don't want it to disappear. You want it to stick around and continue to work into the future. That process of getting code to work and continue to work and doing that efficiently is automated testing. And we're going to spend some time working on how you automatedly add, get the computer to test the code that you are running and continue to get it to test the code that you are running. So that's an important part of this. Now, this visualization tool, it doesn't have a great editor. Okay, It's kind of a simple editor, but you can cut and paste into it and you can run your code. And it will give you a good idea of how those pieces are working and what's being stored in memory and how they're interacting. And that is a really important piece of learning to program is visualizing that. Now, a visualization tool like this has some limitations too. It's not practical when you have millions of lines of code that you're working. The little pictures over here in the images are way too complex. But guess what? When you learn this for yourself and you've got it in your head, your brain is plenty smart enough to be able to go out and handle those pieces in your head and build more complicated code than a visualization tool can do. So a visualization tool is just an illustration on the way to becoming a program. And similarly, one of those things that's useful, but not all the time useful, is Quite often, programs have the ability to stop at a certain point and let you poke into what's going on inside the program. They call these interactive debuggers, and they're useful too. But I'll give you an example of where it's not useful. I worked on a piece of code maybe three years ago where it failed after about five days of running and 15 million interactions with users waiting for some things to happen that happens, oh, five days in and 15 million interactions later, in a debugger isn't going to cut it. You have to have other techniques. We're going to work with some of those other techniques for debugging, as well as using a debugger. So each of these different tools has different capabilities. We're going to be working with them and learning the capabilities. There is a phenomenally good debugger built into Visual Studio Code. I mean, it is really good. And Although I use it, I don't make it my only tool. It's like I have a toolbox and I want a whole bunch of tools in it, not just a hammer to hit nails. I want screwdrivers, I want pliers, I want saws, and I want to use all those tools all at once and know how they work and interact to build the piece of software I'm trying to build. So lots of different tools. Okay, that's kind of the overview of where we're going. And this class, remember there are podcasts and there are links. The podcast will be up on both YouTube and available for download for you to listen to that are, I think, more exciting and more fun than going through the code. But going through the code is pretty exciting too, as far as I'm concerned. Actually getting the concepts of this is what computer programming does. One last note. 
Python is what they call an imperative programming language. It's different than algebra. When I do an assignment, that doesn't mean that the right-hand side is the same as the left-hand side. It means take the values over here on this side and push them into the name over here on this side. Associate the two, which is not like algebra. There are languages that are much closer to algebra. For instance, uh, Haskell and F Sharp are much closer to the way that algebra works. And there are some reasons why you might want to use those languages instead of something like Python. But Python is, these days, the most commonly used, the most in-demand programming language in existence for jobs. And it solves a large variety of programs. And also, it works really, really well for machine learning. It works really, really well for data analysis. My son, who's doing a um, degree here at the University of Wyoming in political science, is learning Python because it's the most commonly used language for doing statistical and data analysis for people working in that field and in economics. So it's a common language that was designed for ease of learning. And it's got lots of utility. And just like any other tool, it's one tool that you need to put into your toolbox as a computer scientist. Not the only tool. There are others. And we're going to briefly touch on some of those others, like how to use the command line, how to use GitHub, how to use Visual Studio. These are all different tools. In an average day, I work with lots of tools, everything from those to things like Photoshop if I'm working on images and Premiere Plus that I'm going to be using in a few minutes to combine these videos that I'm putting into a single video for your lecture. So lots of different tools that work for different specific things. And with that, let's move on to the podcast and get us started breaking this program down into pieces. That's where we're going to be with the next lecture, is installation of software and just at the very beginning of making it certain that this works for you on your computer. Until then.